Welcome to Difficult Dialogues, Voices from the Valley. I'm Lynn Pascarella, president of Mount Holyoke College. Difficult Dialogues is intended to bring to bear voices from the valley on some of the most complex social issues of the day. Today we're going to be talking about abortion rights, and I'm joined by Marlene Gerberfried, who's a professor of philosophy at Hampshire College, and Lynn Morgan, a professor of anthropology at Mount Holyoke College. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. So there's been a lot of recent controversy around access to abortion rights, the Hobby Lobby decision, some of the state decisions to uh, eliminate abortion clinics uh, purportedly out of concern for the health of women. Let's, let's begin there. Um, Lynn, tell us a bit about the, the Hobby Lobby decision. Well, the Hobby Lobby decision was a decision that the Supreme Court took in June of this year, 2014, that said that the Affordable Care Act provisions to provide contraceptive coverage to women did not apply to certain closely held corporations, especially family corporations. And they did that on the basis of a case that was brought by the Hobby Lobby firm to say that their religious beliefs did not require them to provide certain kinds of contraceptives to their female employees. And the Supreme Court sided with Hobby Lobby in that case and said that uh, indeed, the protection of religious liberty meant that certain corporations didn't have to provide contraceptive coverage if it didn't accord with their religious beliefs. It's an interesting decision. How is this, or is it consistent with Roe versus Wade, in your view? Well, I, I guess one thing to say is that since Roe, there's been a series of decisions and state actions that have pretty much curtailed women's reproductive freedoms. So mm -hmm. in some ways, it's certainly part of what we have seen. Um, Roe created a, a, a backlash moment um, for people who are opposed to abortion and contraception. And as someone who's been engaged in the, in the battle for abortion access for a very long time, um, I think that some of what we've said for, forever is, well, abortion is the first step and then comes the efforts to curtail contraception. Mm -hmm. And people thought, no, that will never happen. And I think partly what you're seeing here is that it will happen. And it's not, you know, Hobby Lobby seems like it's more narrowly tailored than you would think, but in fact it isn't. About half the workforce works for closely held corporations. Mm -hmm. um, and the other piece is it looked like it was just restricted to certain forms of contraception, but they're something like 70, 75 cases pending of other employers trying to get an exemption, and some of them object to all forms of contraception. So um, I think in terms of you know, going back to Roe, that the feminists who brought Roe v. Wade believed it was going to be the first step in really expanding reproductive rights and freedom for women. And over the years, it became the ceiling, not the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and once again, you're kind of always pushing again in, a, in a defensive way against um, more and more ways of trying to constrain what women can do. I think that's an important point. You, you said in the beginning that we were going to be talking about abortion rights, and the Hobby Lobby case really isn't about abortion mm -hmm. per se. Right. And yet what it does show us is that there are a number of religious conservative activists that are trying to push back not just on access to abortion services, but on a range of other services, including contraception, something mm -hmm. as basic as contraception. Mm -hmm. And this was a battle that we thought, as feminists, that we had won a long time ago, but it's clearly not the case now. So whereas we're pretty much focused on the restrictions on abortion services, it's really important to put that in a larger context mm -hmm. and to look at what's happening in the pushback against access to contraceptive services as well. One of the arguments that's been made by conservatives who oppose access to contraception is that that really is an abortive agent in many instances. So could you talk a bit about those, those perspectives? Well, that is something that's been debated for quite a while, and it's using a strategy that I think we've seen in a lot of other contentious debates like climate change and others where part of the strategy of people who oppose any kind of progressive social change on these issues has been to sow doubt about what's really going on. Mm. 
and that's what we're seeing in the case of emergency contraception and the purported abortifacient effects of contraceptives that are widely used like IUDs. Mm -hmm. So the science on this is very clear. The science has said over and over again that IUDs and emergency contraception are not abortifacient agents, that they act by preventing ovulation and not preventing implantation of an embryo. And yet people that are that are opposed to these kinds of things keep insisting that there's some question about this this issue. So they're insisting on that as though saying it will make it so, mm -hmm. but that's not what the evidence shows. But as also as though it were a matter of evidence. I mean, as philosophers, what we know is that some of what's going on here is an effort to redefine what pregnancy is mm -hmm. um, outside of the medical definitions mm -hmm. of pregnancy. Um, uh, so I, I, I think in terms of where this is going is to push back as, as early as possible the time when women could not have abortions, when women could not voluntarily end their pregnancy in any way. I think the other piece of this is a lack of recognition of how central contraception and abortion are to women's health and their entire lives. So it's as if contraception is you could be plucked out and you could deliver women's health care without it. 99% of women use contraception at some point in their lives. So it's, you know, it's, it's sort of incredible um, on the part of the Supreme Court to act as if this is not central. And I, I guess that in terms of the bigger picture that, that Lynn is, is raising, it really is important to see that what we're about here is women's entire lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you, being able to use contraception makes so many other things possible in terms of education, being able to take care of yourself and your family, having jobs. So uh, for me, really what's on the line here is something really telling about the value of women's lives. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Roe versus Wade and, and look at some of the subsequent decisions. So Roe versus Wade has been criticized in part for being too closely tied to the state of the medical profession at the time. So when it was rendered, it was what, January 22, 1973. Mm -hmm. And it was a decision that was based on the, the trimesters of pregnancy. And the state had an interest in the protection of the life of the fetus only in the third trimester. Uh, after 28 weeks, when there was a sense of viability. Now viability is much earlier. Could you talk about the, the decision itself? why it's considered a weak decision by both proponents and opponents of reproductive rights for women. Well, Justice Ginsburg, for example, has been one who's argued that um, grounding the decision in, in privacy was the mistake and that it should have been grounded in um, women's equality and, mm -hmm. and rights. So that's, a, and I, I think it wasn't for lack of trying. I mean, the, the feminist attorneys brought many grounds on which the court could have defended or created a right to make a decision about abortion. And the court chose privacy as, uh, in some ways, the most conservative, the most narrow. It was about marital privacy and privacy in the, uh, in, in the marital, behind closed mm -hmm. doors in the marital bedroom. So I think that's one piece. I think the piece about linking it to the time of viability, let's remember that the trimester approach was developed by the court. It's not a medical mm -hmm. um, determination. It's sort of an, right, it's, it's an odd pregnancy. is obviously a process. And to sort of block it off in that way um, is it, it, not something that the medical profession would likely have done on its own. So um, I, I, th I think really what it comes down to is who do you think is best situated to make such a profound decision about a person's life. And I, I, I say this now, I jump out of my philosopher's hat and my yeah. activist hat, and I say it as a woman who's been pregnant, who has had children. And these are such incredibly weighty parts of a woman's life that when I think about it, I think, how could anybody else even have the arrogance to think they might make that decision? Mm -hmm let alone mm -hmm. uh, people who will never be pregnant. Yes. 
So, I, you know, I, I think, I mean, I, you know, I, I'll flip back into philosopher mode as well, but uh, to, you know, kind of look a little more dispassionately at the decision. But I think the, the uh, intensity of this battle is not explicable by looking at the law, the finer points of the law. Um, it's only explicable when you see that there's so much at stake about gender equality, yes. gender relations. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no other issue. There's a lot of ethical disagreement in our country, but um, one side uh, of the uh, death penalty dispute doesn't go out and sh you know murder the other side, mm -hmm. which is what the opponents of abortion have done. So um, I, I, that's how that's the context that I bring to thinking about the legal decisions. Mm -hmm. I agree that talking about equality is really what's at issue here. Um, certainly Ruth Bader Ginsburg said in the decision in the Hobby Lobby case that one of the things that the court did with this decision was open the door to the possibility that corporations would be able to assert uh, their rights on a number of other issues not related mm -hmm. to contraception. For example, vaccines. If they don't believe in vaccine coverage, then they could take a stand saying that corporations didn't have to cover vaccines for their employees or on minimum wage, mm -hmm. or on paying women equal pay for equal work. And they just extended the rights of corporations significantly with this decision. Now, another issue that I'd like to touch on based on your question is about the status of the fetus mm -hmm. in this decision, mm -hmm. because in the Roe v. Wade decision, the, state, the, the court did have to make a decision about when it was going to assert the state's influence over fetal development. And while you're right that the the limits on viability have moved somewhat earlier. It hasn't been as significant as people thought at the time. Um, we were imagining that, that embryos would be able to be grown in vitro from conception mm -hmm. in the laboratory. We're nowhere near anything like that. And the limits on viability have been as early as 22 or 23 weeks, mm -hmm. but in very, very rare cases. So most kids that are born prematurely before about 28 weeks still have to be in neonatal intensive care. And often, if they do survive, survive with significant developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. So fetal viability is, um, is not as much earlier mm -hmm. as the court decided even that many years ago in mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade. But it is problematic in framing it in terms of the state's interest in the preservation of the potential for human life because mm -hmm. that potential exists from the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the justification some states have used in trying to erode reproductive rights. And that's where we return to what Marlene said <laughs> about who gets to make this mm -hmm. decision, really mm -hmm. whose decision should this be. Yes. It's a very difficult decision. I don't think it's a decision that anyone takes lightly, mm -hmm. but it's a decision really that it's hard to imagine as a woman having come of age really in the time of Roe v. Wade, trying to imagine someone else making for me, mm -hmm. taking that decision out of my hands. It's also an example of this, of this, um, uh, this slide between potential life and actual life, mm -hmm. which has been yet another strategy, and, and just keep saying it and then mm -hmm. think that people will not distinguish between. I mean, there's no denying we're talking about potential life. Um, but uh, clearly, um, in millions of women make this decision. Mm -hmm. Millions of um, people who live moral lives, who take care of everybody mm -hmm. else in the society. So it's kind of... Um, uh, it's very challenging, I think, to focus on the women. I think it's why the uh, opponents of abortion had for a long time focused on the fetus, mm -hmm. because it's, they're very vulnerable when they try and talk about women and take the decision away from women. And even, even now, in this moment, when um, things are really tightening up, even the, the Republicans who are in favor of more restrictions have not been running on that platform. Mm -hmm. I think they see that that's not a winning strategy. The court in Roe also referred to the state's interest in protecting the medical profession and the integrity of the medical profession. This has come up in issues of the so-called partial birth abortions and more recently in shutting down clinics for the sake of the integrity of the medical profession. Can either of you comment on, on these issues? And also women's health, I mean, it yes. kind of slides together. Mm -hmm. and, and you do want, you know, we'd like to have a federal drug administration that will theoretically look at things that we're going to take and tell mm -hmm. us whether it's safe or not. And I, I think of it in that way. But 
um, in, in practice, what has occurred is more uh, allowing more and more unnecessary and burdensome restrictions mm -hmm. on abortion provisions or on reproductive health clinics in general. <clears throat> Excuse me. I agree that this decision needs to be thought of as part of a larger strategy of trying to push back abortion rights and reproductive rights and justice all the way across the country. So it's another, I think about it as another strategy, as an incremental strategy that the opponents of abortion are using to try and restrict access to abortion. And they're doing this in a number of ways. One is by putting pressure on in medical education so that uh, medical students shouldn't be taught how to perform abortions. Another is trying to restrict the number of clinics, the access to clinics by imposing waiting periods and permissions and other kinds of things that make it very difficult. Another thing is just putting um, restrictions on the, the organization of the clinics themselves so that some clinics in Texas recently have been fo forced to close because their halls weren't wide enough or they didn't have the kinds of medical facilities that uh, the op opponents of abortion said would be necessary in order to provide it under safe circumstances. But we have to keep in mind that those kind outpatient procedures are done for lots of other conditions. Um, and the uh, Guttmacher Institute just came out with a, a study saying that um, the rate of risk of, of, of dangerous uh, outcomes for abortion procedures was a little bit less than it was for colonoscopies, mm -hmm. which are often done in outpatient facilities mm -hmm. without the same kinds of restrictions being imposed on them. So when you look at the context in which these laws are and, and regulations are being imposed, it needs to be understood as part of a larger strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's a political strategy, not a medical strategy. Yeah. It's not as if suggestions are coming from the health profession saying this is what we need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was part of the controversy around the ban on partial birth abortions, that mm -hmm. if the, the physician, who is the medical expert, is not allowed to make a decision in consultation with the patient about the best course of action, then we've lost something in our society. Um, th can you talk a bit about the rhetoric in, in those cases, what, what partial birth abortions involved, the circumstances under which uh, someone would undergo this procedure, and why there was such pushback. Well, even the language is so politicized, mm -hmm. you know, to partial birth. So I think that um, from the very beginning, the opponents of abortion were able to frame the debate in a way that was frightening to people, that was sort of, you know, horrific, and the images were horrific. But if you actually listen to what doctors and people who gave testimony said, in many cases, um, this is a procedure that is the safest uh, for women who, um, in most of these cases, these are cases where uh, the person who's pregnant really wanted to carry to term, but something mm -hmm. went wrong in the pregnancy. And, uh, but sometimes the, the, the parents want to be able to deliver the, the, the child intact and even hold their child before uh, going, um, moving on. So I just think that um, as a, uh, it frightens me to think that a judge or a legislator is going to decide what's the best health care for me or anybody else. I, you, it would be intolerable if you imagined anything else, you know, you have a heart condition. Do you want the courts and the legislature to decide what the best treatment mm -hmm. is? And do you want the courts and the legislature telling doctors what they're required exactly. to do in specific instances? So we now have laws in this country in several states that require a woman to get an ultrasound and require things like the ultrasound monitor needs to be turned in her direction mm -hmm. so that she can see it if she wants to look at it. Um, they require doctors to use specific language about fetal development mm -hmm. before an abortion procedure. Um, they require doctors to use certain kinds of ultrasound procedures. We saw the big controversy that erupted in Virginia over the uh, vaginal ultrasound probes mm -hmm. um, that were going to be imposed on doctors to perform on women in certain circumstances. So it is, it's not just the impositions on the women, it's the imposition on the medical profession too, and the kinds of procedures and even words that they're allowed mm -hmm. to say. And being mandated to say things they know are not true. Mm -hmm. yes. Like in some mm -hmm. states that you have to 
say that abortion is uh, it uh, will lead to uh, breast cancer or uh, post-abortion syndrome, mm -hmm. which uh, both of which are not true. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, doctors are opening themselves up to medical malpractice by giving misinformation, mm -hmm. and the state is requiring that. It seems to go against earlier court decisions that struck down issuing a parade of litanies, all of the bad things that might happen if women exercise their reproductive rights. Now, Marlene, earlier you had talked about the fact that uh, we shouldn't have a veto over women's bodies, and, and Lynn, you agree with this. The courts have considered whether uh, partners, whether spouses, have a right to prevent a woman or require a woman to have an abortion. That's one issue. The other is parental consent with right. respect to abortion and, and reproductive rights, access to birth control. What do you think about these decisions? Well, and, uh, I mean, spousal consent was one of the first um, shots across the bow after <laughs> Roe v. Wade and, and um, was, in fact, struck down, but uh, continues to creep, crop up now and again. But parental consent is, I think, one that is extremely popular, even among people who see themselves as supportive of abortion rights. And I think it's because, as, as a parent, people say, well, I would want my child to be able to talk to me. Mm -hmm. I would want to be there for my child. Um, I think what, what people aren't seeing is, it, in most cases, uh, uh, teenager, teenagers who are pregnant tell at least one parent. So that's one. And the ones who can't, there's usually a very good reason, um, either a fear of being kicked out of the house or a fear of violence or just the sort of really uh, not wanting to disappoint your parents. There was a case some years ago in Indiana, middle-class teenager, mm -hmm. Becky Bell, who this was her thing. She just couldn't face how bad her parents would feel. She had an illegal abortion. She died. And her parents, who had previously been in favor of parental consent laws, they, they just became activists mm -hmm. after that because they saw something they hadn't mm -hmm. seen before. So um, I, I think that, it, again, it's, it is about respect. It, do you think that a teenage pregnant person sh can make her or her own decisions about what's going on? And is there anybody else on the planet who's better situated to make that decision. Mm -hmm. I think that's the other piece of this always. Mm -hmm. Who would decide? One of the things I'd like to do is to put your question into a larger context mm -hmm. about the uh, abortion opponent strategy, which is to try and, and mm -hmm. reclaim rights, discourses for their own causes. So whereas they saw human rights being used to argue for reproductive rights, for sexual rights, for the rights of minorities, for the rights of disabled, um, they started realizing that they could use that discourse of rights also to apply to parental rights, to father's rights, to fetal rights, to natural rights, and to family rights. And that, that they used that kind of language to try and oppose public sex, sex education in the schools, mm -hmm to argue that fathers should have a right to make a decision about um, their wife or their partner's abortion um, decisions and other kinds of things. So we have to understand this as really a, a debate over who's going to own rights mm -hmm. and whose rights are going to take precedence in, in these kinds of issues. Mm. I was observing, there, there's a new UN report just out and uh, in it there is a strong affirmation for women being able to make their own decisions as a, yeah. a, a grounded in human mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in terms of where we've come in our own understanding of reproductive rights issues, um, at least now in, in the U.S., and it resonates a lot internationally as well, is the idea of reproductive justice. So moving away from uh, abortion and contraception as standalone issues of uh, individual choice and looking more at what does a person need in order to create the kind of family mm -hmm. that they want to have. And when, if you do that, even as an exercise, just in a little thought exercise, what are all the things that are implicated in that, then you actually see a much larger picture of needs and access that, that, um, that, that an abortion becomes, I, I think it situates it where it belongs, which is part mm -hmm. of the rest of your life, not just 
something that goes on at a certain part of your body. Well, Marlene's being modest here because she was one of the people who came up with the notion of reproductive justice, uh, which is a, a notion that reproductive rights should be expanded beyond uh, considerations of autonomy and individual liberty to include things like access to all of the things that make it possible for us to have children or not to have children under uh, the circumstances that would facilitate their, their upbringing. So those include things like housing and employment and uh, equal justice under the law and all sorts of other things in addition to the what we think of sometimes narrowly as reproductive and sexual rights. So I would just like to correct the record, but thank you, that's very generous of you. Um, but really the concept of reproductive justice, which is having its 20th anniversary this year, was developed by a group of African American women. They were at a pro-choice conference and they had a caucus and they started talking about the needs of women in their communities and realized that choice was simply not big enough to hold all of those other issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so um, they, they created this concept and then I would say my own role in this was to be able to document the groups that have then taken that as, as, uh, as their way of advocating for a whole mm -hmm. range of issues. And it makes a lot more sense in a way. I mean, it, it, to me, it goes back to, it makes sense of, of why there's so much fire in this battle. It makes sense of why it doesn't go away mm -hmm. um, because it's a very long-standing fight about uh, how many who gets to decide. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just really comes down to that. Mm -hmm. So in the last few minutes, let's talk about buffer zones and recent uh, court rulings on uh, what you can say outside of abortion clinics and or reproductive health care clinics and under what circumstances? Yeah, I, I guess we should start the discussion by reminding ourselves that while the Supreme Court um, declared the Massachusetts buffer zone illegal, of, it was 35 feet, the Supreme Court has a buffer zone of 98 feet mm -hmm. around it. So there's a wonderful mm -hmm. image of it mm -hmm. showing the Supreme Court's buffer zone and then the piece of that that <laughs> is the... Uh, Massachusetts case, but um, hypocrisy has never been a strong suit of the opponents of abortion, so I, I mean, it has been their strong suit. Um, what, what the court did is it, it again, it, it looks like it's a relatively narrowly tailored case. It's, it's specific to Massachusetts, saying 35 feet is too big. It didn't speak to buffer zones that are smaller than that. Um, the other thing to think about here, this was a unanimous decision, unlike Hobby Lobby. And so it means that the justices that one usually counts on for supporting uh, women's rights went along with it. And I, 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 there's a lot of speculation as to why that's true, you know, th them realizing they didn't have the votes, so they, they tried to go along with something mm -hmm. that they thought would be less dangerous. But I just wanted to talk a little about the context in which buffer zones arose. You know, why do you need a buffer zone? And I was part of a group that uh, spent a lot of time in the um, late 80s, early 90s doing clinic defense. And this was the time before buffer, buffer zones when there was uh, harassment at clinics, picketing, efforts to blockade the clinic doors, uh, screaming at women, threatening them, taking pictures, grabbing at them. Um, and of course, there have been eight murders of people involved in abortion care, two in Brookline, Mass, in uh, 1994. And that, that was the immediate context for the need to remove protests of all kinds away from, and, 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 and I guess I want to even say it's not even protest. I mean, this was harassment, mm -hmm. um, pure and simple. And um, I, I heard someone interviewed who been an anti-abortion leader at that time in Massachusetts. And the a, a fr effort to frame this as just freedom of speech, you know, we're just trying to talk to women, we're just trying to deliver a different message. And then I have the image, he was actually someone who was arrested and went to jail because of his just trying to talk to women. So um, it wasn't, it, it's not this benign uh, people just trying to have their say but it really is about trying to attack clinics and women and makes it much more dangerous and frightening. 
Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add to that is that it's important, I think, that reproductive health services get incorporated into women's health services more broadly. The only reason we have this issue about yeah. buffer zones is because there are freestanding clinics that provide abortions because so many other hospital facilities or medical facilities won't. And so once we include and consider women's health more holistically, then I think some of these issues might be less important than they have been in the past. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you.